Are you a musician who's looking to expand your network and collaborate with other musicians? In this video, I take you behind the scenes of the Rustic Songbird podcast, where I interview Jonathan Warren, who is an instrumentalist who has worked with multiple artists, many, many bands, and has great experience building a network of friendships and relationships that last for life. So I hope you get a lot out of this conversation today. I hope that it inspires you to reach out and start those collaborations because we need connection now more than ever and as the music industry is constantly changing, relationships and networking matters so much. So I want to invite you to subscribe to this channel for even more videos like this coming soon. And if you'd like to check out the archive from the Rustic Songbird podcast to hear interviews like this with people in the music industry, just go to rusticsongbird.com slash podcast for the whole list of previous episodes. Real quick, I want to let you know about a free challenge that I've put together for songwriters to help build your confidence and put yourself out there and to show up at your best because perfection is overrated. To join this free challenge, go to rusticsongbird.com slash challenge. My guest on the show today is Jonathan Warren, and he is a fiddle player. I appreciate that because <laughs> when you are a fiddle player, um, specifically, it's how you play the instrument. He plays the violin, but plays it as a fiddle. So I'm excited to talk to you about your story today, Jonathan, and have you on the show just to talk about networking as a musician, because you have definitely stood out. I have multiple friends that have recommended you for strings and for studio projects, as well as live performing. And I just see your name everywhere and thought you'd be the perfect person to come on the show and talk about this and just give some tips from your experience. So welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. This is, this is awesome. So tell me a little bit about your backstory of becoming a fiddle player specifically. <clears throat> what was that music influence like? Uh, what got you started? Yeah, so I actually got into music mostly because of my great grandmother. She loved watching the public broadcast network and everything. She would always put on either the symphonies or the bluegrass uh, players. And she really, uh, I spent a lot of time with her when I was when I was super young and she really gravitated towards that fiddle music. She was from uh, a part of town that had those family meet and greets where everybody would join around at the, uh, the campfire or on the front yes. porch and do some picking and grinning. Uh, so, she just kind of had that in her blood. She'd always do that little two-step shuffle um, dance to any bluegrass music that was playing. So it was just a lot of fun. And I saw how it, it kind of lit up her world when, the, you know, those bluegrass players would come on uh, the Bill Gaither homecoming videos or whatever she had mm -hmm. playing. Um, so I actually asked my mom for two years because, uh, of course, mom kind of thought it might be, you know, just like, the whim of a child that would mm -hmm. end in a, in a week and she would have paid, you know, who knows how much for lessons and instruments and all that stuff. So yeah, she wanted uh, to make sure you were serious before exactly, starting lessons. Exactly. Um, but uh, two years asking her, we were finally just driving by um, one of the music shops in town. And I was like, mom, can I please play? Like, I really want to learn how to play this fiddle song that I hear. Uh, and she was like, all right. And she stopped the car, turned around, went to the, the music shop and she was like, okay, I'm going to buy you a violin. I'm going to buy you lessons and you're going to give me at least a year of this, you know, like there, it's going to be you gotta tough. Commit. And, <laughs> she also knows that violin's like one of the hardest instruments to start learning because there's yeah. no frets and you squeak the whole time and right. you know, it can, it can be very discouraging. And so a lot of people mm -hmm. quit early. Whereas, you know, if you get past a certain point, then it becomes really, really fun. Uh, but I was so excited to play the music that I loved hearing that I never really had that problem. I just always loved, if I squeaked, I was like, why am I squeaking? I'm going to figure this out. I would stay and <laughs> practice for hours, not because I was trying to like practice, but because I just, I really wanted to sound like the people on TV. Yeah. So, so it was just. It was, uh, the rest is history, I guess. Just uh, grew up playing, uh, went through classical training. Uh, my my first teacher actually taught me by ear because he didn't necessarily read 
uh, he called them shape notes or music notation. He just, he yeah. did it all by ear, but he was a classical player. He played in the Philharmonic and everything, uh, the Richmond, Richmond. Um, so he taught me by ear and that kind of got my ear training up and yeah. I went through all the youth symphonies and auditioned for lots of different stuff all the way through middle school and high school. And then eventually made my way to Nashville because I heard Belmont was doing stuff where they would teach you more than just classical music. And they teach you like, you know, you get to train with fiddle teachers and learn how to play jazz and learn how to be rhythmic and do chopping and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that was in 2010, graduated in 2014. And now I'm here making a career out of it the best I can. That's amazing. And you do an amazing job. And it just goes Thank to show you. how putting your focus towards one thing, like one instrument, one style, and just sticking with it, you're going to get better over time just by doing it and by practicing and having that drive. Like you said, you've got to play a lot of times when it squeaks to get through to that point where it's just smooth like butter. And so Absolutely. you are at the point now where you've put in years of work, you've practiced, you've learned from the best teachers, you know, people that are teaching in that style that you want to play in. And then also just, man, the school of hard knocks of going out and playing live and learning on the go. So what was that like for you when you went through school, you went, you were playing with groups like that and then started playing along with bands? Was well, that after you got to Nashville that you started playing with bands like that? So my first, my first rock band that I played with, um, there was a orchestra concert that we were trying to do in high school where they wanted to bring in this, you know, rock star, local rock star musician uh, with their band. And they wanted, they wanted us to uh, have the experience of arranging the tunes together as a class to play behind the band. Uh, so we did a whole lot of like, you know, standard stuff like Eleanor Rigby and those type of tunes. Um, that everybody could get behind. And then we were going to use it to raise money for the orchestra program. So this rock band was in there and I was helping arrange some tunes and it was time for everybody to go to lunch. And I tended to take my lunch break in the practice room because I just didn't want to stop playing. So everybody else went to lunch and I went to the, the practice closet we had and I was just playing through some of these tunes. And um, Janine the head of Offering, who was this uh, rock band slash worship band. I don't know how you, you would categorize them, but she heard me playing and she was like, hey, we're actually doing this little thing at a coffee shop later. And me and some of the guys heard you and wanted to know if you just wanted to come hang and play some tunes with us uh, tonight. Uh, and I was like, yes, of course, absolutely. So I went to that, played with them and it was awesome. And they ended up, we ended up playing a lot of shows together. And then they took me aside, like maybe a month after starting playing with them. And they were like, Hey, we want to go to China. And we've been trying to get to China for years now. And it looks like it's finally going to happen. Would you and your mom like to come with us? So <laughs> Cause you were a teenager, play. right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> like get your mom's permission and we'd like her to come with us like let's go to Beijing and play uh, and we actually did it as sort of a missionary type thing because we couldn't go okay. over there as missionaries per se but, but you could uh, go we as over, performers right we went over as a rock band and then what when we weren't playing music we were uh, helping like migrant workers we were painting murals on uh, cleaning up city streets and cleaning up you know, areas and stuff like that. So cool. that was like my first rock band experience and my first touring experience all within like this month of this concert happening at my high school. And it just, it blew my mind. It opened my mind up because I had just never seen violin being anything but classical. And I was kind of mm -hmm. starting to get a little worn out on just doing the classical stuff. Um, yeah. So it opened up a whole new world and all of a sudden you're touring internationally as right. a teenager. And had to bring your mom with you. <laughs> my my experience Amazing. is similar. Like I had my mom come with me for so long because I was like too young <laughs> to drive yeah. for a while. And then I was like too young to go places by myself. Uh, that's so funny. So was that the first time you had traveled internationally as well? Like ever? Yes, it was the first. Everything. What a huge, <laughs> what a huge step all in one go. 
and I, I got bit by the bug there that, that I just needed to be on the road. I needed to be touring. I was like, I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know anything about this lifestyle, but this is what I want. I want to play for people and I want to spread joy like this. Like, mm -hmm. it, especially when you go to another part of the world, there's just a different kind of joy. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, different groups of people might get fed up with certain types of music, or they might just get bored by the mundane, you know, every day hearing a musician play. Uh, but there's just places that you go and you play and it just lights up their whole world. And it's like, you know, the amazing, it was just an mm -hmm. amazing feeling. I selfishly, I just always want to recreate that with every performance. That's why whenever I'm playing, I'm always smiling. I'm always very mm -hmm. conscious of I feel like as a performer, you're kind of giving the audience the permission to do whatever. So if I'm up there looking too concentrated, too serious, like I'm not having a good time, then I'm not giving the audience any permission to have a good time. But if mm -hmm. I'm up there acting goofy, smiling, dancing, having a good time, then I'm letting the audience know that it's okay. If you feel that way, let's do it. Let's dance, mm -hmm. you know, let's Then smile. you're creating that moment of joy. Exactly, exactly. That is so cool. So you got to see that there was uh, more of a creative outlet. There were different things that you could do than what you had previously experienced. And so that opened up a whole new world. And then right. what about moving to Nashville? Did that change like the styles that you were doing? Were you into more like a country bands than rock at that point? What did that transition look like? Yeah, honestly, it started, it started out a lot more, uh, jazz infused than I would thought I guess because uh, Belmont kind of uses jazz as the foundation of all commercial music because hmm. you can learn all those different techniques and then expand them into country or pop or you know whatever style electronic or uh, you know rock any of that stuff it can all be found in those you know the way that jazz is able to use all 12 notes in a certain way to make melody and harmony and rhythm like uh, that's something that can be translated so it was actually a lot more jazz than I was expecting. I was expecting hmm. to just come here and just learn country fiddle because that's what I yeah. wanted to do. <laughs> um, but no, it was very cool. And and that kind of opened myself up to playing with a lot of different groups, not just the rock bands that I was used to, but also country and jazz and pop groups. Uh, there was a lot of opportunity for that at Belmont just with the different people. But I also think um, one of the smartest things that I did, and I didn't necessarily mean it to to be this smart um, was playing free gigs whenever I could. So I had, uh, there was a lot of people in my school that, that didn't, that shied away from the free gigs. They were like, I'm trained, I'm good at this. I know I'm good, mm -hmm. I can do this. I shouldn't be playing for free. You know, like if you, if you need me on your record, you need to pay what I'm worth. Um, but I had this rule kind of personally for myself that every month I wanted to take at least two free gigs because I started noticing that most of my paid work and some of my best gigs came from somebody who heard me play one of those writer's rounds or yeah. one of those free gigs. So mm -hmm. that ended up being, without me knowing it, that ended up being my networking strategy because personally, it's funny that I'm on here about networking because I am such an introvert. Like on this podcast, you probably won't tell. And on stage, you probably won't tell because I'm a bit... But let me tell you, after this podcast is over and done recording, I'm going to go sleep because it takes <laughs> a lot out of me to, to, to be the type of like cheery person that I want to be in front of camera or mm -hmm. on, on a stage. But again, I feel like it's super important to be that way because it's about giving permission to experience moments, you know? And I'm glad so, you brought that up because there's probably people listening that feel that way as well. Like they have such a passion to share the music and then it's exhausting and they're just like drained afterwards and have to go take a nap or like just be away from people and have some silence. Um, yes. So there is an element of like bringing your A game, giving it a hundred percent and then going to recover and rest. And that part is really important too. That's just yeah. the part that nobody sees, right? They see you like super excited on the stage, but they don't see the recovery process. So I think it's good to bring that up and just let people know if they feel that way too, that it's normal for introverts. Exactly. Like, especially if you're not, um, if that's not your personality to just be like hype all the time, <laughs> it's okay yeah. to take a break, but it is important to like have that energy on stage. So the audience feeds off of that. So that's really good. I love that you said that you took a few free gigs purposefully 
And you saw the value of that because you were meeting people that then heard your music and they wouldn't have heard it otherwise. Then they asked you to come and play for paid gigs. That is definitely something that I've seen with other successful artists and musicians that they will give first. And they'll say, hey, I'll come and do this. And mm -hmm. what they're doing is totally valuable and it is worth getting paid for, but you need that attention. And so if nobody's ever heard of you, they won't know to book you for the thing. But if they hear you just in passing or get a card or swap information or something, they're going to call you back. And so I think that's a really good point for anybody either getting started or wanting to meet more people that there's value in doing some things for free. And I like that you said, I'm going to do two things a month. So that gives you some boundaries. You're not just playing everything for free, but you're saying I'm going to be consistent and at least put some effort into doing free gigs and paid gigs. So there's a balance there. Exactly. And you know, everybody includes these uh, networking mixers and stuff like that. And there definitely is a place for that. That was never my cup of tea because of the introverted person. I, I have a hard time going up to somebody and say, hey, I'm a great violinist and your project would be <laughs> bomb if it had me, you know, here's my card. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a hard, I mean, there's, there's obviously better ways of having that conversation, but in the end, that's what you're doing. And the networking mixers are great if somebody is going there looking for you. Like if somebody has a project and they're intentionally looking for a videographer and you introduce yourself as a videographer, you hand them their card, then they can go and look up and say, yes, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Let me give this guy a call. But a lot of my gigs happen because violin is not necessarily something that you think right away will go with your music because mm -hmm. you've either heard really squeaky, not so good violinist in the past or you don't necessarily know exactly the capabilities of what my instrument can do so right. what happens is me just telling you i'm a violinist you go well i'm in a rock band i don't i'm, I'm never going to use this i'm going to you know put that in my yeah. cardboard you but know? if they hear it and see how it works that's a perfect example and then they'll say i want that exactly so if they hear me with the rock band and they see that i'm using effects and how i can i can sound like kenny g with the right effects pedal you know what i'm saying like i can fit into your sound i mm -hmm. don't have to sound like a squeaky violin or or a country fiddle playing your your jazz tune or your rock tune um and yeah. that's just something that i don't like to tell people i like them to hear it and make up their own mind because if they don't like it then i'll never have to deal with the uh the disappointment of them not liking but if they do like it then i'll i'll get a random instagram message and say mm -hmm. hey i want to send you this this trap music and hear what you do with it, you know? And that to me has been super valuable. And honestly, all of the network I have done since I've been in Nashville, I have, I have never necessarily made an advertisement for myself. I've never put out any marketing. I'm thinking that I probably should. That's something that I'm, <laughs> I'm missing out on uh, because, but all, all of my stuff has always been word of mouth and I've been yeah. able to get such a steady flow of, of income, just being able to, you know, provide whatever I can and, and being the best person that I can when people do meet me, you know, cause that's also yeah. super important. Word of mouth is the best way. And so if you're yeah. already doing that, you know, advertising could be on top of that. But like you said, putting things out on Instagram, showing people that you can do stuff, they're going to send you messages. And I know when I went a certain thing like if I'm looking for an instrumentalist for either a live performance or for a recording I'll ask around I'll ask my friends that are recording who are you using I'll ask other bands or I'll ask producers that I know like who do you know that's a good studio session player for this instrument and so I think being in those circles just working with those people they're gonna know who's gonna show up on time who's gonna do a good job who's gonna have a good attitude and be fun to work with and so having just that one that personal recommendation speaks volumes and so if you're already working with people they're going to keep passing your name on and that's what's happened with me I mean I've seen your name with multiple friends and so now when I think of a fiddle player for session players I'm like Jonathan would do a great job you know even though we haven't actually worked together yet but I'm sure that's probably going to happen because of those people talking you up and doing the advertising for you because they've yeah. worked with you, they've had a good experience. And so they're going to recommend you when somebody asks, and that's the best way to do it. You said something really important that I feel like we should spend a second on. Okay. When you said that 
that like you showed up on time and you, you know, it's to me, networking is one thing, but anti-networking is absolutely another thing that can happen. And the problem with it is networking is something that you control for the most part. Anti-networking is something that you don't control. When you get the gig, when you get the connection and you end up being the person that's late, the person that's not countable to learning your music that shows up, that doesn't do a good job or doesn't do what's expected or is, wants to be lazy. Well, then that person that you worked for is going to tell everyone never to hire you because they want to save their friends from having the terrible experience that they had. So being a jovial person, even when you're an introvert, like I'm talking about, is just one of those things. Being ready for the gig, ready, prepared. Try and always be the most prepared person in the room. You may not always be the most talented person in the room, but you can certainly strive to be the most prepared. You know? Oh, that's so good. Yes, because I've seen some amazing musicians that are like so good. They could play in their sleep, but because of that, they are lazy or they're entitled or they feel like I'll just show up. I don't need to practice. Like I'll just roll in and do my thing. But then you're missing out on, you know, those conversations that happened before you're missing out on, you know, time to just double check everything and make sure you're in tune and like the basics um, and just being respectful of like the venues and the people you're working with and making sure you're not, you know, the person with the bad attitude. Cause I feel like you can have like average talent and be a really nice person and you're going to get more gigs than if you're like really talented, but have a bad attitude. So yes, that's part absolutely. of it. I, I have been in that situation. I'm living proof. Some of my best gigs I have gotten, uh, and I've replaced people that I feel like could play circles around me. Um, and most and most of the time it has something to do with either they weren't a good hang on the bus or they just had a really crappy attitude or they didn't want to do rehearsals or whatever, you know, one reason or another that they were willing to take somebody who was not doing crazy jazz solos over the country and they were willing to take me because I do have a great attitude. I strive to be helpful whenever I can. I do, I, I try and go the extra mile wherever I can in whatever circumstance. That's just who I want to be known as. I want people to think of me and think of that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I have definitely been that person, you know, um, I'm not going to be too down on myself about talent because I'm always striving to get better, but there is just sure. a reality to that, that sometimes the better players don't get the gigs. And there's so many reasons why that can happen. And uh, you can benefit from that, you know? Yeah, that's encouraging for anyone who's like, well, I'm probably average. Like, I'm not the best player out there, but, you know, I'll have a smile on my face and show up on time. So you're like instantly a better person to be around. And so people are going to call you back based on their experience with you even more than just your talent level. So I think that's something to be considering if somebody is like newer, like either less experienced or maybe they feel like, um, you know, they haven't had as much experience as somebody else, like comparing themselves, they could say, well, I'm willing to bring a high standard, like absolutely give it my best in every area. Uh, then there's a lot to be said for that. So you mentioned a little bit ago about playing for free and then playing paid gigs. And I know that you travel and tour with different groups and you've been doing that a lot. So since everything was shut down and canceled for months, you've had to pivot what you're doing. And so I think networking and who you know goes into that a lot. So what was that like for you when you realized, oh, all these gigs I was going to play in person are now canceled. What do I do next? What was that like? Terrifying for about a day. Uh, the, the first day when I realized like, okay, everything's shut down, but not only is it shut down, it's going to be shut down for the rest of the year. Like, like bars are closing and going out of business because they can't, they can't stand to be closed this long. You know, like when that day hit and I was like, okay, this is the rest of the year thing. I've got to find another way to do this. Uh, it was terrifying. Um, but then I realized uh, just like before that my same strategy and my same uh, thought process can be applied to getting into a new market. So 
this virtual collab thing that I've started doing is definitely a new market for me. Um, yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, so I basically, I, I, re I reached out to some people and had some people reach out to me about doing just collab videos. And I said, hey, let's just, let's just make this, you know, really easy. Just send me a video of you playing um, the melody or, or one of your favorite tunes, and I will just record myself playing along with it. Um, and then I'll put the video together. I have some experience with that. Like, we'll just, and we'll just put out like a little Instagram video. Um, mm -hmm. So we put out that Instagram video and I posted on it. Hey, I really want to do more of these virtual collabs now that everybody's stuck at home. Like, let's still find a way to make music together and spread some mm -hmm. joy. Um, and I had like 20 people reach out to me saying, yes, let's do it. Wow. How do we do this? How do we do an, inst how do we do a collab? What app do should I use? You know, yeah. what, what are we? Like, how's this going to work? Right. So I had to figure all that out. And so mm -hmm. I basically, and geez, I've only done maybe four or five of them since that. So I'm still working down that list of those initial 20 yeah. people. And That's after such each a one great of these, idea, though. yeah, after each one of these, I've been getting maybe two or three people without me necessarily asking for it, reaching mm -hmm. out and saying, Hey, could we do this? Um, so that list is still growing and I'm struggling to catch up, but that's a good problem. Yeah. And this kind of falls under that, that free gig thing, because mm -hmm. I'm not asking them to pay me any money for this. That's ridiculous. Um, yeah. and I'm, uh, and fortunately none of them have asked me to pay any money yet <laughs> either. Yeah. Although so like it's, it's free could. advertising basically. And you're cross promoting with their audiences as well, because it's tagging them and they're posting it and sharing it as well. So more people are going to find out about you and your music through this and other artists will find you because of doing the collaboration. So it's really brilliant. Yeah. And, and exactly what you're saying. I, there, there are some people that like to just post it on one to drive the traffic and the, and stack the social proof onto just one post. I'm more of the strategy of wanting to just blitz the network, especially since I'm not a big artist, like not a lot, a lot of people know me. Mm -hmm. Um, so the oh, more the better. <laughs> exactly. So I yeah. post it on my page and I have them post it on their page and we both, you know, do stuff with it. And I post it on Facebook groups and, you know, it's all about getting both of us out there and in front of everybody. It's like those commercials you see on TV that are like, they seem to be on every channel, but yet mm -hmm. you can't forget them <laughs> because you see them all the time. That's what I want to do with this. That's what I want to do with social media and with everything else. It's like, I just mm -hmm. want to be everywhere I can. Um, and yeah, so you've made work. that pivot of instead yeah. of doing free gigs live, you're doing collaborations and that's taking the place of that. But then also you've had your time freed up to be able to record stuff in your house and then send it to studios. So now that you're not as busy touring, you're actually recording more. So what was that like? Were people starting to call you or did you reach out to them or some of both? Well, honestly, um, some of some of these collaborations have led to me doing some more of that studio stuff because people see that I have the capability to record myself and video myself. And mm -hmm. so it started off with people reaching out to me to be in their video collabs and saying, like, can you just record your violin? And if you could get a video while you're recording, I'd love to make a video of all the different musicians. Well, then some of their friends were producers that saw that video and was like, hey, who's that violinist? And then they reached out to me on Instagram and I've had maybe five or six, like I said earlier, uh, reach out to me saying, Hey, we're working on music. We're still trying to put out our album and still trying to meet these deadlines, even though mm -hmm. the world shut down. Um, yeah. Do you have capability to record from home and what's, you know, what do you use? What DAW do you use and mm -hmm. what can we do? So, yeah, so I've, I've been, getting files from them that are nearly done because a lot of times violin is like the the sprinkle on top of a recording yeah. so everything everything else is pretty much already done uh and then i'll just set up my microphone and plug into logic and i will just do maybe two or three runs and give them all of the takes so they have the option to mix and edit it and add their own effects i always send it I always send one version that's wet, meaning like with reverb and stuff to kind of mm -hmm. see, show them how I hear it. 
And then I always send them the dry version so they can mix it into their project and use, you know, whatever editing they want to do uh, to make it sound the way they want to sound. That's so good. And thanks for talking about your setup too, because I'm sure there's people listening that, you know, may have gone into a studio and all of a sudden they're trying to do the home studio thing, recording themselves. And then also just the communication back and forth of what files to send, how many takes to do, like uh, there's a bunch that goes into it, but I like that you keep it simple where you just say, this is my method. I set up my mic. I've got the sound, like do a couple takes, send them everything you got, and then they can mix it down. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for that, uh, whether you're yeah. doing your own cover songs, your own original music, whether you're doing collaborations or actual studio recordings, there's so much you can do just with your phone or like a mic and a laptop and either uh, edit yourself or send it to somebody else to be edited. So if somebody is listening and interested in doing that, it doesn't have to be complicated. You can go really simple with it and still get a good product. So I actually right. just did that on a single that I was supposed to go in and record and then everything got canceled. And the only thing we needed was background vocals. And so I thought, well, I've done background vocals. I'll just do it at home and send the files. So I ended up doing that and I did four takes. I just sing along with the recording in my headphones. I sent them everything. I was like, I don't know what's in tune or out of tune. I'll just send it all. And it got mixed in. It sounded amazing. You'd never know. I recorded it in my kitchen. Right. So yes, it's absolutely. really good to be willing to innovate during this time, being willing to learn technology, just figure things out either by asking people questions or Googling it or <laughs> YouTube tutorials are super helpful if you learn better by seeing somebody actually doing it. So I think there's just so much opportunity out there. And you talked about pivoting and being willing to try new things and uh, seeing what's working and doing more of that. So uh, you talked a little bit about the response and I just think it's good to note that a lot of times musicians will get discouraged about the numbers of like people watching and views and likes. And you just talked about putting, you know, maybe one post out there, one collaboration, and they may be getting five messages from people wanting to work with you. Think about that's five people that probably wouldn't have messaged you and that makes a big difference, right? So even one view, you never know who's going to be watching. And that could be the, the next connection that you need for yeah. maybe a paying gig or, you know, a lifelong connection. So that's what I want people to see from your story is that this is something they can duplicate. So for anybody that's listening and wanting to network with more musicians, I hope this has given them some ideas, but what encouragement would you give musicians who are, you know, just wanting to get into those circles? Well, I mean, you're your own broadcaster. You're you're the you're the gatekeeper. It used to be that you had to be with a major label or you had to be, you know, touring with a big group. Um, I like to tell people this. Um, I mean, I've I'm now uh, an a Codebo ambassador and a Three to Various ambassador. These are like really top notch instruments and bows. And I'm not necessarily an anybody, you know, I'm not the the big player playing with the huge artists. I'm not, I got these opportunities because I reached out to them with an offer and I said, I can help you this way, you know, and I, mm -hmm. uh, it, it all starts from just reaching out and reaching out to, to people and um, not being afraid to put yourself out there. And also just know that everything you do is networking. Every yeah. post you make, every every comment that you have on a comment thread, um, you've really got to be mindful of that stuff. You gotta you've got to know that everything you do is shaping who how people perceive you. So mm -hmm. if you perceive yourself as a nice person on your videos, but then you write some nasty comments on other people making fun of you know them not being able to play as well as you or something else like that, you're setting yourself up for that anti-networking that I was talking mm. about. Yeah. So people are watching and it makes yeah. a big difference. Even on your personal stuff. I think anytime I put something online, I just know this is public information and I want it to be consistent with everything. So I just don't post anything if I don't want everyone to know about it. So, you know, there's some things that you can keep to yourself and then you have to be mindful of 
like how are people going to perceive this like you said they might not know the backstory of this or they might not know you're joking so it's important to be at least intentional with what you're posting and as musicians we have free platforms that we can put our music out on we can talk about our music we can show behind the scenes for free so this is not even like paid advertising uh there's a whole other world of that but there's so much that we can do for free and even just asking people to share things and posting consistently are things that have helped me. And so anybody can do that. They can start where they're at and ask people to share. Um, they can comment on other people's stuff. And that reciprocity comes back because if you're commenting on other musicians stuff, it's they'll notice. Word. Perfect. Then yeah. they're gonna check out your stuff, you know? And so they're gonna want to see what you're up to. They're gonna want to work together and exactly. that's just how it works like it doesn't have to be complicated <laughs> and you don't even have to yeah. call it networking you know just having conversations with people uh interacting encouraging other musicians i think we all need encouragement because we're our own worst critics and a lot of us are perfectionists and want things to be perfect before we even start or put something out there and it, it just you know it takes the guts to just start and right. put yourself out there and keep putting things out there consistently because you never know what that one post is going to be that one video or that one interaction that's going to lead to something else in the future so where yeah. can people find you online where can they get connected with your music and hear what you're up to uh all my socials are jonathan h warren so uh any social platform uh jonathan h warren and send me a message and DM me. I would love to talk to you. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing from your experience and some of your story here on the show today. I hope it encourages someone to take action and try something different. So thanks for being on the show, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Hey, don't forget to sign up for my Confident Songwriter Challenge. It's absolutely free and there's a link in the description. You can click to join today. It's a free challenge for songwriters to help build your confidence and to show up at your best because perfection is overrated. Make sure to sign up today by going to rusticsongbird.com slash challenge or just clink, clink, click the link in the description below and I'll see you in the challenge. Thank you for watching this behind the scenes episode of the Rustic Songbird podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and I want to invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel for even more videos like this coming soon. Also, check out the whole archive of previous podcast episodes by going to rusticsongbird.com slash podcast. All right, hit that subscribe button and I will see you in the next video.